Well, good morning. It is sure good to see every single one of you here this morning. My name is Carlene. I'm the executive pastor here at Epic Church, and I just want to say welcome to everyone. Today is a very, very special Sunday, and we have many guests that are joining us this morning as we celebrate Child Dedication Sunday. We'll get to that in just a bit, but because we have several guests with us, I want to go ahead and just share several things that you can expect throughout the gathering this morning. First of all, when you walked in, you found this connection card on your chair, and this is something we all do here at Epic Church, whether you're a guest or a regular attender. So go ahead and take this out, fill it out on the front, and you'll see on the back there's several different sections that we're going to refer to throughout the gathering this morning. And then after the gathering is done, we'll turn in these connection cards to the individuals who are standing on either side of the doors. And for those of you who are online, welcome. Your connection card is on Epic's website or the app, so you can go ahead and fill that out as well. So on the back of the connection card, right in the middle, you're going to see it says information on baptism. And last Sunday, we had an amazing baptism Sunday. And the next one is coming up on December 5th. And so if you are interested in taking that next step and getting baptized, go ahead and indicate that. We'll send you more information. I'm going to meet with those who are interested in baptism just to talk through what does that signify? What's the importance of it as we prepare for December 5th? And so if you're interested, you can mark that on the back of your connection card. As far as what to expect throughout the remainder of the gathering, after announcements, we'll do the child dedication portion. And then after that, we'll have the message this morning. Pastor Jeremy is starting a brand new series, and we're really looking forward to that. And then after the message, we'll have two more songs. And we use that as an opportunity to respond, and we have several ways to respond during that time. First of all, over here in room 208 is our prayer room. And so if during that time you want someone to pray with you or you want a quiet space to pray on your own, there will be people from our prayer team that will be standing right next to the door and you can just say, hey, I want you to pray with me or I want to pray by myself and you can just head in there and there'll be a quiet space for you to meet with God on your own. Up here next to the stage, you'll see there's these communion tables that are set up. And during that time of worship, if you are a follower of Jesus, we invite you to come and you can simply take one of those cups Take it back to your seat and just pause and celebrate and remember what Jesus did for you. And we look forward to gathering on Sundays to be able to take communion together. Another way that we respond is through the receiving of tithes and offerings. But at Epic, we don't pass a plate. Instead, we have several different options that we offer. The first is online through our website, epic-church.org. Also, the app for Epic has the ability to give there listed. With your connection card, you found those giving envelopes. That's another opportunity. And then on your way out, you'll see those worship boxes on either side of the doors. That is another way that you can respond through worship. And it is through your generosity that we are able to partner with what God is doing. And he's working in some amazing ways. Here in this church, we get to partner with what he's doing in the community around us. And we get to partner with what God is doing around the world and other different countries. And just amazing stories are coming of how people are making disciples who make disciples who make disciples. And we love that we get to be a part of that. But if you're a guest with us this morning, we're glad that you're here. After the gathering this morning, you can swing by the Connection Center and pick up one of those white gift bags. Those are for you. And we look forward to seeing you again next Sunday, getting to know a bit more of your story. We're so glad that you've joined us this morning. Well, our mission statement as a church family is living in and living out God's love. And I'm going to invite Anne LeVan, who's our director of worship and outreach, to share a tangible way that we get to live out God's love. Yes, thank you, Carlene. So I'm excited. It's November now, right? We are now out of October, and it kind of is feeling like fall now. But something that we've had the opportunity to just do every year during this season is um, collect money and items to provide families with Thanksgiving. And last year, we did 75 families. This year, we had a goal of doing 100. And I have been connected with, I think, all but two elementary schools on the, in Mishawaka like School City of Mishawaka and PHM, and there is a huge, huge need this year, even greater than last year. So we may need more than 100 boxes. Um, right now, we have funds to cover about 30 of those boxes. So if you are feeling like you'd like to help sponsor one of those boxes, it's about $35 for the perishable items. We do have all of the non-perishable items that we need. Those have all been donated, so we are super excited about that. So that is a way that you can help these families um, have Thanksgiving the meal um, this year. Another way that you can get involved is to help pack those boxes. Sunday, um, November 21st, right after the gathering, we're going to be packing all of this. 
And then I really need actually a lot more people than I anticipated for Monday morning to deliver because we're going to be taking it to about 12 different schools. So if you have the availability and a vehicle that can load a bunch of boxes in, um, it'll probably take about two hours that Monday morning. You can sign up for all of this on the app. If you go onto the app under the outreach button, you'll see Thanksgiving boxes. You can sign up to donate towards the Thanksgiving boxes. You can also sign up um, to serve that day. But we're just excited. We love to be able to do this and partner with the schools every year. Um, so we are thankful to be able to do that. I'm going to have Pastor Jeremy um, come up right now, and we're going to do some child dedication. Well, good morning, everybody. Great to see you. As uh Ann mentioned, and as Carlene mentioned, uh, today is a special Sunday. It's Child Dedication Sunday. I always look forward to this. I really do. And, you know, some people, uh, uh, you know, we, we have the question of, what, you know, what is child dedication? What, what's happening? What are you guys doing here? I mean, what, what, what's the method behind your madness, if you will? And so uh, basically what we're recognizing when we do child dedication is that, it is a, that these children are a gift from the Lord. And that they ultimately belong to him. And additionally, it's a commitment that these parents are making before the Lord. And what they're saying is, is uh, as parents, we will commit to doing everything that we can to create a lifestyle for our children so that they will choose to follow after Jesus with all of their heart, soul, mind, and strength. Additionally, they're going and saying, God, help! <laughs> right? and some of you parents are like, yeah, I get that. I understand that. God, help! Okay, so that's, that's ultimately what we're doing. We're saying, God, we need your help to, to, uh, to help raise these kids in the way that you'd have them to be raised and that we as parents can point them towards Jesus. Now, for some of you, um, maybe you've had a background growing up or, or so forth uh, in a way of where you're just wondering, why would you do a child dedication? Why aren't you doing like a, a child or an infant baptism? Perhaps you're familiar with that. Um, that's a common question. It's a really a good question. And uh, the reason we do it the way we do it at Epic is because in the Bible, we don't see any evidence of anyone being baptized until after they have made a personal decision to follow after Jesus as their Lord and Savior. Additionally, um, we, we, don't, uh, we don't see anybody that's uh, uh, getting bap or rather being uh, baptized when they're, when they're real young, but what we do see is we see with Jesus, who is like 30 years old, we remember that he's God. When he was 30 years old, that was when he was baptized himself, and now I've think about this. If he's God, he could have been baptized at any stage of life he wanted to, but he chose to do it when he was older. And so I think that, you know, that's part of what we're putting together. Some people have asked, well, then what, you know, why, you know, what about salvation? Do you have to be baptized in order to be saved? And again, we don't see evidence of that in scripture either. In fact, what we do see is we see that there was a thief on the cross who died and Jesus didn't get all hung up, pun intended, uh, on, on <laughs> bad joke. <laughs> Jesus didn't get all hung up on the fact that he was not baptized. In fact, he said, you'll be with me in heaven. Okay? And so, um, so what we see here in Scripture is that there is a picture of child dedication that takes place. In fact, in 1 Samuel chapter 1, God blesses this woman named Hannah with a child, and she recognizes that this child belongs to God and that he is a gift from God. And she takes, the Bible says that she takes and chooses to dedicate him unto the Lord. We even see the example in Luke chapter 2 over in the New Testament. We see that Jesus was a young child, and he too was brought to the temple by his parents, and the Bible says, to be dedicated to the Lord. And so this is why we do what we do. And so this morning we have parents that are prepared to make that commitment of child dedication to the Lord. And so I'm going to ask those parents to please stand with us this morning. Parents, as you present your children do you confess your personal faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? If so, say we do. Do you commit before God and these witnesses that you will, with God's help and guidance, undertake to influence your, ch your child to come to know Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, raising them according to God's will and according to God's word, making use of all the helps God has given you in the family and in the church of Jesus Christ? If so, say we do. Now, I'm going to ask everyone, if you're, uh, as part of the congregation, if everyone would just stand, please. Um, and I'm going to ask you, if you're able to and you're willing to commit yourself to this, um, that you would pledge your support, if you'd be willing to pledge your support through prayer and a, as a personal example, I'm going to invite you to read the congregational commitment together with me uh, on the screen. Let's read together. With God's help, we will live our lives after the example of Jesus Christ 
so that these children and all the children who come to this church may be surrounded by unconditional love, established in the faith, and confirmed and strengthened in a way that leads them to follow Jesus Christ wholeheartedly as their personal Savior. You may have a seat. However, if you are a family member or a personal friend who is here to support them, we're going to ask you to remain standing at this time. And what I would invite you to do, if you're comfortable doing so, is I would invite you to go ahead and move out of your seats if you want to. Go ahead and lay your hands on, on uh, the parents of these, of these children. And this is just an act of saying, hey, we, we're just here. We're supporting you. We're behind you. And, uh, and I'm just going to do a prayer of dedication over these parents at this time. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the gift of these children. Lord, uh, while you have entrusted these little lives to these parents, we acknowledge that they ultimately belong to you. Father, as these parents um, dedicate their children, would you give them strength and godly wisdom to raise their children according to your holy word? May they model the love and the truth of Jesus through their lives, and may it compel them towards you. We ask that these children would receive your gift of salvation through Jesus and that they would be filled with the presence of your Holy Spirit. May they serve you faithfully to be disciples who make disciples for you, Jesus. Father, help these parents to take hold of their responsibilities to be parents that reflect Jesus to their kids. Lord, we commit these lives to you. May they help advance your kingdom and bring you the glory. And we pray this in the powerful name of Jesus. And everyone agreed and said, amen, amen. You guys can have a seat. Thank you. All right. This time we're going to have uh, our first set of parents come on up. Danny and Roby Davidson. Awesome. All right. Who do we have here? Nova Mae Davidson. Now, I'm going to uh, not hold her. Normally, I try to hold these children and such, but uh, in light of our current circumstances and such, and uh, true confession, I'm vaccinated and everything, but I, my family did have COVID, so we're just bit playing it a little more safe here, okay? <laughs> just keeping it real with you, all right? So let me just, uh, let me just declare a blessing over you guys. Um, Nova Mae, may you understand that you are a deeply loved child of God. And may you, may you receive the joy and the peace that God has for your life. Your parents love you so much. You are a blessing. And they are long, their longing for you is that you would be so filled to overflowing with the presence of the Holy Spirit, with the presence of Jesus Christ. And as we think of overflowing, we think of you being so filled that it touches the lives of others. It spills out into the lives of others. And so may you be empowered by the Holy Spirit. May you be filled with the hope of God, and may that hope be transferred to others. And so, Nova May, this is why your mommy and daddy picked out Romans 15, 13 as a verse for you. And it says, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so, Nova May Davidson, I bind any generational stronghold in the name of Jesus, and I dedicate you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We have our next family coming on up. Chad and Megan Huff. Lacey's especially glad that I'm not doing this, this part of holding the children. <laughs> uh, Lacey, your pastor's a little short. <laughs> Lacey, you are also a, an incredible, wonderful gift of God, and you have a pure heart. And your parents love you very, very much. And they long for you in the midst of this confusing world, that you would guard your heart and that you would allow the love and the truth of Jesus Christ to fill that heart and that your roots would go very, very deep in him. 
and that everything that you say and everything that you do would truly flow out of your heart for Jesus. And so this is why your parents have chosen Proverbs 4.23 for you. Above all else, guard your heart, for everything you do flows from it. And so, Lacey Victoria Huff, I bind any generational stronghold in the name of Jesus, and I dedicate you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, we are so thankful for these families. And listen, if you, uh, if you have a child and you have not yet dedicated them and you would like to uh, uh, participate in a child dedication, would you please indicate that on your connection card so that we can follow up with you and let you know when our next child dedication is going to be and, uh, and allow you to walk through that, that process. Well, uh, we are starting a new series titled Family Reboot, Restoring Your Family to God's Original Design. And so we're going to be talking about family today, uh, but you need to understand that whether you're married or single or widowed or you're uh, divorced or whatever you're at, whatever your status is, you are a part of a family. And I promise you that God is going to speak to you through this series. I really do believe that. Uh, The message today is titled, The Fall of the First Family. And we're not talking about uh, the fall of the first family in the White House, no matter, what gen- no matter what administration you're thinking of in this, okay? What we're talking about is the first family that ever existed. And so we're going to be looking at Adam and Eve, and I want to invite you to look with me in Genesis chapter 3, um, as we're, which is where we're going to get started here. Now, I don't know if you've thought about this or not, but you have biological characteristics from Adam and Eve. Have you thought about that? You have biological characteristics that go back to Adam and Eve. We're all a part of that first family. We're tied back to that first family. No matter what your tribe, no matter what your ethnicity, no matter what your race, no matter where you came from, we're all descendants of Adam and Eve. And I love that picture. I love the thought, the truth, really, that we are all brothers and sisters. We're all connected together, and it's so true, and I love this. And so we have physical and biological characteristics that we receive from Adam and Eve. We have physical characteristics that we've received from Adam and Eve. Now, with that in mind, I want you to think about this. Let me ask you this. Do you think that it's possible for us to have spiritual characteristics that tie back to Adam and Eve? Um, Do you think that it's possible for us to have spiritual genetic tendencies because of the fall or the sin of the first family? Now, here's what I want to do. I want want you to think about this. Before we read these verses, um, do you realize that there was a time where every person on this earth was in a perfect relationship with God and they were in a perfect relationship with each other? And in just a few sentences we're going to see that every single person was in a splintered or a broken relationship with both God and with each other. And so this is, with that in mind, this is where we're picking up here in Genesis chapter 3, starting at verse 1. And this is what it says. The serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals the Lord God had made. One day he asked the woman, okay, pause right there. I want you to notice how he immediately casts doubt on the word of God here. Okay, and he's still doing that today, if you stop and think about that. He's still using the same old tricks, the same old tactics today. Um, the first thing that Satan tries to do is he tries to cause people to doubt the validity of God's word. And so look what Satan says. He says, did God really say that? Did God really say? Did God really say you must not eat the fruit from any of the trees in the garden? Verse 2, of course we may eat fruit from the tree in the garden, the woman replied. It's only the fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden that we are not allowed to eat. God said, you must not eat it or even touch it. If you do, you will die. You won't die, the serpent replied to the woman. Okay, again, I want you to immediately notice that he's saying that God's word is wrong. Okay, God's word is inaccurate. God's word is incorrect. Again, the enemy still uses the same lies, the same tricks, the same tactics today. Verse 5, God knows that your eyes will be opened as soon as you eat it, and you will be like God, knowing both good and evil. Verse 6, the woman was convinced. 
In other words, she was deceived. She saw that the tree was beautiful and its fruit looked delicious and she wanted the wisdom um, that it would give her. And so she took some of the fruit and she ate it. Then she gave some to her husband who was where? Notice this. Where was her husband? He was, say it with me, he was with her. How many times have you pictured this story? If you've pictured this story before and you picture Eve having this exchange between the, the, the serpent, Satan himself, and, and her, and Adam's off somewhere else by himself, I don't know, doing what in the garden, right? That's not how it was. He was actually there with her, according to scripture. They were there side by side during this exchange. And it says that he ate it too. So let me ask you, what entered into every family in the world in a millisecond? Just like that. What entered into every family right there? And it's still there today. The answer, sin. Sin. And we're born with, with sinful natures. And it's carried all the way back to Adam and Eve. Now let me ask you this. What came with sin? Have you ever thought about that before? What came with sin? sin. Well, based from this passage of scripture, I want to tell you three things that came with sin that we're going to dig out of the scripture here, okay? So if you're taking notes, you may want to write these down. The first one is this. First thing that came with sin was shame. Shame. This is the number one characteristic that sin brings with it. Uh, Let's keep going on in in verse 7. It says, at that moment, their eyes were open and they suddenly felt what? What did they suddenly feel? They felt what? Shame. They felt shame at their nakedness, so they sewed fig leaves together to cover themselves. Verse 8, when the cool evening breezes were blowing, the man and his wife heard the Lord God walking about in the garden, and so they hid from the Lord God among the trees. Then the Lord God called to the man, where are you? You know, some, some of you today, God is asking you that same question. He's calling out to you in the same way, and he's saying, where are you? In other words, where's your heart? Verse verse 10, he replied, I heard you walking in the garden, so I hid. I was afraid because I was naked. Now, I want you to notice the question that God asks him next. Verse 11, he says, who told you? Notice that. Who told you that you were naked? The Lord God asked. Okay, so God asks him, who told you? This is a rhetorical question. Think about this. God was not going and asking these questions and saying, where did you guys go? I just can't seem to find you. I have no idea where you went. God is not going and saying, oh, who told you that? Like, I did not know that. I I was not aware that somebody told you that. God asks these rhetorical questions so that we will process, so that we will stop and think and reflect and take in where are you at? What's happened to you? And so in other words, he says, who told you? In other words, he's, he's saying, um, who told you? Who's, what's making you to feel ashamed? Now, please don't miss this. I want you to notice that before they decide to try and hide from God, they actually try to cover up and in essence, hide from each other. And it's because they're ashamed. The very first thing that comes after sin is shame. And because they were ashamed, they tried to hide and they tried to cover it up. They were ashamed of their nakedness. Now, you know, all through the Bible, it really it, it alludes to this, it talks to this. Let me show you a verse that refers to this in Revelation 3.18. This is what actually Jesus says. He says, so I advise you to buy gold from me, gold that has been purified by fire. Then you will be rich. Also buy white garments from me so that you will not be what? Say it with me, so that you will not be shamed by your nakedness and ointment for your eyes so you will be able to see. Okay, hold on to that. We'll come back to that in a moment. So immediately there's this shame that we see taking place here. Now, I understand this. I grew up with this. Many of you have too. I remember a time when I was a young boy and we were camping with my uh, female younger cousins and I had to go take a bath. And my younger cousins saw me naked. Oh, I was ashamed by that. I was so embarrassed by that. I'm still embarrassed every time I see them. They're always, they never stop laughing at me. Uh, but it, we, we, we go with this. We live in this sense of shame, this sense of embarrassment that can come. And Adam and Eve felt ashamed by their nakedness. And they had never felt shame before this point. They had never felt shame prior to this. 
They'd never also, they'd never felt fear before this. And sin enters in and they try to cover up. They try to hide from each other. They even try to hide from God. Now think about this. They were married. They were married. So who was looking at them? I mean, they're the only human beings on the earth at this point. They didn't have children that could like walk in on them. You know what I'm talking about? Okay. It's just them. I mean, there's animals around, but who cares about the animals? Why are you feeling ashamed? Why do you feel like you got to cover up because of the animals? I mean, who cares if they see you naked? So what was it? Remember the question God asked them. He said, who told you that you were naked? Do you know what it was? It was a sense of shame. And we have carried that ever since. We have a spiritual shame that comes over our nakedness, both our physical nakedness and our spiritual nakedness. Now, I'm not saying that we shouldn't have modesty. We should, okay? We are not proposing that we start the first nudist colony church here. That is not what we're saying. What we are saying is that we, 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 there is a nakedness or a shame that comes over us, um, for, starting with the nakedness, spiritual nakedness and physical nakedness, there's a shame that comes along with the sin. There's a shame that comes along with sin. Look with me at Isaiah 61.10. It says this, I am overwhelmed with joy in the Lord my God, for he has dressed me with the clothing of salvation and draped me in a what? In a robe of what? Say it with me. A robe of righteousness. Hold on to that word righteousness. This is going to be so key for you to hang on to. We're going to come back to that in a moment, but hold on to that word righteousness. He says, I am like a bridegroom dressed for his wedding or a bride with her jewel. Now, back in the passage of Revelation that we just looked at a moment ago, when Jesus said, I advise you to buy white garments from me, He's obviously not talking about physical garments, okay? It wasn't like Jesus was suddenly saying, hey, you know what, I think I'm going to become a, a tailor or a seamstress here. That's not what he's doing. He's talking about the nakedness of your shame. He's talking about your spiritual garments. And in this passage of Isaiah that we just read, he's talking about the garments or the clothing of salvation and being covered with the robe of righteousness. Again, hold on to that thought of righteousness. I'll unpack that in a moment. Now, let me listen to me very carefully. What this is saying is that the only solution for shame is actually the righteousness of Jesus. And you will never be truly righteous enough in your own strength, in your own doing. You will never be able to overcome shame in your own, on your own, in your own strength. It's only through the righteousness of Jesus Christ. Now let me be really vulnerable and honest with you. I struggled with shame in my life. I, I had to have people walk with me and speak into my life and help me to get over shame and get through shame in my life. The enemy used to beat me up and used to tell me that I didn't have a right to stand in front of people and to tell them about the truth of God or to share God's word because of things that I had done in my past. And, 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 and you know, it's one thing when you have done things that you're not happy about or that you're ashamed of that you did before you're a Christ follower. It's a whole nother thing when it's something that you have done after you have become a Christ follower. And about 20 years ago, I was wrestling with things that I had done in my past as a Christ follower, as a pastor. And I went and I handled it in the right way. I went and I humbled myself. I confessed it to my leadership at my church. And to my surprise, they didn't condemn me. They didn't take me out back to shoot me which I've seen too many times. And, and I, in fact, I found that um, some of them had similar struggles in their past, so they knew how to help me and put me on a path towards healing and restoration. But the enemy was taking and killing me with my shame on the inside because he had me isolated for a little while. I was isolated, and I was believing the lies. And this is why I believe the book of James says what it says. It says, confess your sins to one another so that you may be healed. It doesn't say so that you'll be forgiven. Jesus already took care of your forgiveness. It says so that you may be healed. It's so that others can be the voice and the mouthpiece of the Holy Spirit to say, you're healed. And it speaks a lot louder than the voice of the accuser. Are you following me? Now, I'm going to ask you to be honest this morning. Maybe you said something that was 
deeply hurtful to a person, something really sinful. Perhaps you lied. Maybe you've gossiped about people. Maybe you've done something that has devastated your spouse or something that you did that uh, was unfaithful to a significant relationship that you had. Maybe you're battling or maybe you've battled a, an addiction at some point in your life. And so here's what I'm going to ask you to do. Whatever it might be, how many of you, honest as you will, can be and will be, how many of you have ever really blown it after you have had a relationship with Jesus? If you've ever really blown it after having a relationship with Jesus, would you just raise your hand if that is you? Okay, awesome. It should be most of you, if not all of you. For those of you who are not, gonna keep those hands up. Keep them up. Come on. None of this halfway, like, I guess that was me. Now, get it up there, okay? I want everybody to look around, and I want everybody to see what we see here. We all are a bunch of imperfect people that come to Epic Church, right? And I, oh, how we need Jesus. And here's the reason I had you do that. Because Satan will isolate you, just like he did with me, and he will tell you, oh, there's nobody like you. You have really blown it. There's nobody else that's blown it like you. There's nobody else that's as bad as you are. And so when that happens, here's what you say. You're right, I blew it, but God. But God. I blew it, but God sent his son to cover my sins. I'm forgiven. Listen, the blood of Jesus covers everything that you have done before you were reconciled to God and forgiven of your sins. But the blood of Jesus also covers everything that you've done ever since. And if it doesn't cleanse and if it doesn't cover the sin that we've fallen into after we've begun a relationship with Jesus, then we are in real trouble. We're in real trouble. Jesus took on your sin and your shame when he went to the cross. So he longs for you to be set free. He longs for you to be free from that shame. Here's the second thing that came into the world after sin. Blame. Blame. Picking up at verse 11 in Genesis 3, it says, Who told you that you were naked? The Lord God asked. Have you eaten from the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat? Now watch this. Verse 12, the man replied. Look at how he replies. He says, it was totally my fault. I own it. I admit it, God. I messed up. I blew it. I totally made a mistake. Is that what he says? <laughs> no. That's not what he says. What does he say? He says, say it with me, he says, it was the woman you gave me. By the way, this has been going on for 4,000 years, ladies. He says, it was the woman you gave me who gave me the fruit and I ate it. Verse 13, then the Lord God asked the woman, what have you done? And look what she says. Hey, the devil made me do it. <laughs> I mean, in essence, I wish... That's what she says. Specifically, she says, the serpent deceived me, she replied. That's why I ate it. Now, I want you to notice the separation that sin immediately brings. Immediately, they are separated from God, but there's also, they are separated from each other. Do you see this? They're separated from God, and they are separated from each other. Again, prior to this, they're in a perfect relationship with God. They're in a perfect relationship with each other. But then sin and shame enter into the story. And notice what Adam does. He blames two people in one sentence. Okay, The woman you gave me. I was doing just fine with the chimpanzees, God. It wasn't until she showed up that we had a problem. By the way, it wasn't just that she showed up. It was also that you are the one who gave her to me. See, sin immediately brings separation in our relationships with God and with others. And can I just remind you that this is why we need God, God's righteousness. Remember, I told you to hang on to this picture of this word righteousness. I want to unpack this for you. I had a mentor a few years back share this with me, and this was so powerful, so important for me to get because so many times we hear these Christian terms like righteousness and holiness, and, the, and we don't really understand what it really means. And this word righteous, righteousness, okay, what this word really means, when you break it down, what it literally means is right relationship. You might want to write that down. Righteousness means right relationship. And so I have a righteous relationship with God, right relationship. I have a righteous relationship with you, with others, right relationships. This is so important. And we get this right relationship, watch this, through the righteousness of Jesus. 
This is why we need the righteousness of Jesus. Now, what, who do you, but here's, here's the thing. Who do we usually blame when we mess up? Who do we usually blame when we mess up? We blame God and we blame others. We say things like, it's not my fault. It's not my fault I'm like this. Okay, please hear me. When I say this, I am not throwing stones at you because I have walked through this many times myself. You see, we intuitively know that if we can get rid of the blame, then we can also get rid of the shame. So it's not my fault. It's not my fault. It's somebody else's fault. Or we might do the other extreme. See, this is the other thing that shame will cause us to do. We can live in the other extreme where we go and say, it's all my fault. I'm worthless. I mean nothing. Just pile it on me. It's my fault. I'm horrible. I'm a no good person. Just put it all on me. Blame me. Okay? Some people do that. But most of the time, what we usually try to do is we usually look for someone else to blame. And I've been terrible in this area as well. When something goes wrong, I want to know, well, who's supposed to have taken care of this? Uh, and instead of just fixing it or getting to the bottom of it and taking care of it, I, I, I just I want to know who's responsible. Who dropped the ball on this? Who's to blame for this? Who's supposed to take care of it? Well, here's the thing. God many times is like, Jeremy, really, does this really matter? You know, why don't you just get it? Just take care of it. Just do it. But yeah, I, I want to blame. I want somebody to blame. Now, please don't miss this because here's what happens. If you play the blame game, and if you have children, you will start to see it emulated in the lives of your kids too. Oh, they will start to play the blame game. If you go on to Genesis chapter 4, you will see Adam and Eve's son, Cain, who is blaming his brother Abel for God not accepting his offering. And so they, the, the cycle just continues with our kids. Uh, have you ever seen a kid that will never own his or her share of the blame. Have you, anybody ever seen, I'm sure it's not your kids, but have you ever seen those neighbor kids, you know, that just never own up to their stuff? Yeah. Uh, most of the time, that characteristic is, is a magnification of what they have been seeing modeled for them. But so often, this is just the way we are. Now, let me give you another word for blame. In fact, you might want to write this word right next to the word blame if you're taking notes on this, okay? Another word for blame is the word called accusation. Accusation. Um, we accuse people, don't we? we? We have a tendency to accuse people. Do you know where the word accusation comes from? It actually, it comes from the accuser of our brothers and sisters in Christ according to Revelation 12. It says that it comes from Satan himself, who is known as the accuser. So we have shame, we have blame. Here's number three. Finally, we have fame. I had to make it rhyme, okay? So, in other words, I want to be known, I want to be important, I want someone to recognize me. I want you to notice that in verse 13 and 14, God outlines the curses that they have brought upon themselves. I want you to notice it's not the curse that he puts on them. We often think of it that way, uh, this angry God throwing the curse on them. In essence, rather what's happening is they have, this is a curse that they have brought upon themselves. Now, please don't miss what Adam does immediately after this. Most people have never seen or understood the significance of this moment and what he does. We often gloss right over this and miss it. This is huge. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 20, it says this, Then the man, Adam, named his wife Eve because she would be the mother of all who live. Okay, that doesn't sound so bad at first glance, right? Not a big problem. Except for this. Let me tell you what, what it means when this happens. Adam immediately separates from his wife. Immediately. Immediately. And most people don't realize that God wasn't the one who actually named her Eve. Did you know that? God didn't name her Eve. Adam is the one who named her Eve. And you need to recognize her name was not Eve before they fell into sin. That's huge. She wasn't named Eve until after the sin. You want to know what her name was before? Her name was Adam. 
Adam. That's the Hebrew word. In fact, Genesis 5, 2, from the King James Version, uh, I'm reading from the King James because it uses the original Hebrew name for them without interpreting it. Most of the newer translations interpret it and put down mankind. But this is what it says. It says, male and female created he them and blessed them and called their name, plural, their name, Adam. Okay, that's the Hebrew word, Adam, in the day when they were created. Okay, so her name was Adam or Adam, female, Adam, woman. Um, His name was Adam, male, Adam, man. Okay, now remember this. This is Genesis 3, after they fell into sin. Do you know what Adam said right before they fell into sin in Genesis 2? Do you want to know what he said? Watch this. He, 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 he calls out to her and he says this about Eve. He says, you are bone of my bone. You are flesh of my flesh. You are a part of me, he says. Okay, so in essence, what's happening is in Genesis 2, Adam is saying, we are one. In Genesis 3, he says, we are different. You are separate. You are Eve. You're the mother of all the living. Now, some of you might be thinking, well, what's wrong with that? I mean, after all, women are mothers. Okay, hold on. Listen to this. He labeled her. He labeled her. He, in essence, said, let me tell you what your job is from here on, woman. Your job is to bear me kids. Now, don't miss this. Do you realize women have been, women have been struggling with this for 6,000 years? Is this, they're wondering, like, is this my purpose on this earth? My job is just to bear kids. I'm just a kid-producing machine. I just keep popping them out, popping them out, popping them out. Is that, is that, is that my purpose in life? This is why many, many, many women go through depression when their kids leave their homes. Because they're like, I guess my purpose is done. Because they believe that they have fulfilled that purpose. I want to tell you something, ladies. It's not your purpose. Listen to me. God has a purpose. God has a gifting. God has a calling for every person on this earth, male and female. Let me get really vulnerable with you, okay? I don't, I don't like this part of me, but I'm just going to be real with you. There have been times that I have really struggled with this in my own marriage. You see, Anne is a very gifted leader. She's a very gifted worship leader, as you, I don't probably need to tell you that. You probably see that quite well. God has gifted her, and he has called her into this. But there have been many times where I can be selfish, and I can be like, man, I just wish I could just keep my wife at home to myself. I'm tired of all the things she has to go out and do. I'm tired of her always have to do this and do this. I want her just for me. I want her to be at my beck and call. I want you to be there when I'm there, and when I'm not there, I don't want you to be there either. And yet the Lord Jesus Christ has brought me back to this question. Listen, he's asked me, Jeremy, are you about my kingdom or not? Hello? Are you about my kingdom or not? How about this one? Are you about laying down your life for the kingdom of God or not? Because every woman has a gifting and a call from God even when the kids are in the home and even when the kids are out of the home. And by the way, women, your highest calling is not to be a mother. And you have heard that, and I understand where people are trying to come back to and what they're trying to emphasize, the roles in the family. And trust me, I believe in the family. I'm all for the family. With all that I am, I believe that we are supposed to be great husbands and great dads and great moms and, and, and great, great spouses. I believe all of that. I really, really do. I try to live that. But your highest call, your chief purpose Your highest call as a mother is not to be a mother or a father. It is not your chief calling. Your chief calling, your highest calling is to be that of a child of God. That is your highest call. Your highest calling is to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Then all these other things will be added unto you. Like intuitively we know this. We even say things like, okay, so... Um, Here's my priority list. God first, family second, business third. And I'm telling you, there is a calling on every man and on every woman. 
Now, let me tell you another part of the, about the fall of the first family. This part of the fall is when we go and we say, in kind of a degrading way, well, let me tell you what your call is. Your call is to do this. By the way, this is labeling, and it's in every family. We hear things like, aren't you so-and-so's son? Or we, we label things like, by, by going and saying things like, well, you know kids. You know how kids are. You know what they do. They just rebel. You know those pastors, kids. Listen, they don't want to be so-and-so's son. They're saying, I want to be who I am. I want my fame. I want to be known for something that I do. Aren't, and yet we go and we say, aren't you so-and-so's younger brother? I mean, our, your, your, your brother, man, he was a really good athlete. and I, We went to state when he was playing football. Are you going to play football? Are you a good athlete too? Have you heard anything like that before? Maybe you've said things like that before. Aren't you so-and-so's sister? She was a valedictorian. She's really smart. She's a good student. Are you a good student? And I used to hear that all the time about my sister. She was a valedictorian. I wasn't. She was younger than me. <laughs> hey, listen. I still was in the top 10% of the bottom third of my class. So <laughs> you got that going for me. I mean, kids, see, they hear these labels kind of put on them, and they just go the other way. Do you know why? It's because they want to be known for something of their own, even if it's bad. And if they can't find anything good, they will resort to being known for something bad. And they want daddy to look at them, and they want daddy to notice them. Fathers, don't ever, ever take for granted your roles. So that's uh, one of the ways that we label people. Here's another way that we label them. Ah, uh, you know Mike. You know how Mike is. Mike's always going to be Mike. He's always been this way. He'll always be this way. Mike's just the black sheep of the family. Let me show you another thing in this area of fame here. In Genesis 3, 16, it says, And you will desire to control your husband, but, you, but he will rule over you. Hey, now that doesn't sound so good, does it? Now, some of you men are like, oh, it sounds great to me. <laughs> Haven't seen it played out in my household yet, but it sounds good. <laughs> now, if you're a man, you might even be like the type of Bible thumper who you're like, hey, woman, listen, this is how it is. Listen up. Um, <laughs> before you continue living in ignorance and getting your butt kicked at home, let me clarify something, men, that is a, that, that's so important for you to understand about the context of this scripture, Okay. That part is the curse of sin. That's the curse of sin. As Christ followers and as brothers in Christ to our sisters in Christ, we're never supposed to rule over. We're supposed to servant lead. We're supposed to be servant leaders, not dominators. Let me take you back to this word desire in verse 16. The word for desire in the Hebrew, the original language that this was written in, Hebrew, is the word teshuka. Do you know what that means? It means to be independent of and to dominate. Now, you have to remember, this is God saying, let me tell you the consequences and the effects of your sin now. Here's the effect of your sin. This is what God is saying in the context here. Here's the effects of your sin. He's saying, you're going to always be trying to control and dominate him, but he's going to dominate you. And by the way, God's not saying this and saying, oh, and I'm so happy about this. This is exactly how I designed it. This is exactly how I planned for it to be. This is my original plan right here. I want men to just rule over and dominate. That's not what God is saying. He's saying, these are the consequences of your choices. This is what you brought on yourselves. But please understand this. Never forget this. In Christ, the curse is broken. In Christ, the curse is broken. In fact, would you just turn to somebody right now and say that? In Christ, the curse is broken. In Christ, we don't dominate each other. We serve each other. In Christ, we love each other. Because outside of Christ, it's competition. 
And by the way, that's the root word in this word here. It's competition. You're going to always be competing with each other. You're always going to be trying to manipulate and trying to control each other. And think about this now. This competition thing, it even takes place and it happens in our kids too. Cain tries to compete for the best offering with his brother Abel. And Cain gets so mad that he ends up killing his brother. You know, it's unbelievable to me the way we see kids in competition against each other. The crazy part about it is it continues even when they've grown up and are supposed adults. Right? They're growing up and they're still competing with each other. Like They're talking about how big their new house is, how, how big of a raise they got, um, how, how much, uh, of a, how much uh, smarter my kid is than your kid, how much better of an athlete my kid is than your kid. Okay? This came from the fall of the first family. It is the spirit of competition. Again, I want to remind you that every person here has a biological characteristic from the first family, from Adam and Eve, and every person here has a negative spiritual tendency that goes back to the first family. So what's the answer? The answer is Jesus. The answer is always Jesus. But let me share it in a more specific way. Remember that Jesus was born on this earth. Listen, maybe you've never thought about it. Jesus was born into a family. Why? It's because he came to repair and restore the family. The family that was broken in Genesis 3, Jesus comes to repair in the New Testament. And he was there, he came, to, he wants to take back and take us back to God's original design and God's original plan for relationship, for righteousness. Let me read you a quote from the New Testament, which is actually quoting from the Old Testament. The Apostle Paul says this in Acts 3, verse 25. He says, and in your seed, now he's talking about Abraham, but the seed he's speaking of is Jesus. He says, but in your seed, and watch this, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Jesus came to redeem and to restore the family. I just want to remind you that shame is the very first characteristic of sin that we see in the family the very first one. It says, immediately they knew that they were naked and they tried to cover themselves and hide. Listen to me. If you will allow Jesus to set you free from the shame, it will take care of so many of these other things because all these other things lay on the foundation of shame and you need to turn it over to Jesus. I want to invite you to take out your connection cards as we consider our next steps this morning. Let me ask you, what is God saying to you today through this message? Would you just write that down on your connection card? Whatever that might be. What is God saying to you today? I want to ask you, what is it that you need to be set free from? Write that down. The reason we have you write this on your connection card is because we as a staff and leadership, we take this very seriously. We pray over this. We take this incredibly seriously. I want to share something with you that I wasn't originally planning on sharing with you beforehand, but as I was praying with the prayer team this morning, um, I just sensed God bringing this, this to my mind. And uh, it's this. If, you, uh, if you're in this place and the Holy Spirit is just tugging on your heart and saying, man, there's some things inside of you that need to get healed up, need to get addressed. Yeah, you've, you've invited Jesus to be your Lord and Savior, but you're still carrying a bunch of old shame, old woundedness. You're still playing the blame game. You're being identified by your insecurities. If that's you, um, there's a book that, that I want to encourage you to go through. It's actually, uh, it's called A 21-Day Inner Healing Journey. It's written by Jimmy Evans, and it's actually a personal guide to healing past injuries and hurts and how to become emotionally healthy. And it's based off of scripture. And uh, I love it because it's, it's short, short chapters, but then there's questions to journal through and to talk through and to process through. And it's something that you can do by yourself, but it's also encouraged that you do this with other people if you'd like, even in a small group. If you're interested in going through this, if you're interested in this book, if you'll indicate that on your connection card, we will send you a link to it this week and uh, help you get this book. But I just, I thought, man, this book has been 
helping so many people, thousands of people all over. And uh, if maybe this is something for you as well. Let me pray over you as we prepare to respond through worship. Father, we thank you that you are a good father. We thank you, God, for your presence here with us. Your word tells us where two or three are gathered in your name, that you are present in our midst. So welcome here. We ask, Holy Spirit, for you to continue to move and to speak to us. Lord, there are many today that are wrestling and, and, and battling with shame, even hidden secrets, things that they don't ever want to talk about. And we know, Lord, that there is an accuser who constantly wants to keep telling them, you're not good enough, you're the worst ever, and they just, he just keeps filling us with lies. Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would rebuke the lies and that you would help us to step into the truth. Because Jesus, you said that if we know the truth, the truth will set us free. Would you help us to know and to live in that truth? And so God, I pray in the name of Jesus for healing, emotional, spiritual healing over those today that are wounded, that are carrying baggage with them. We need you. Lord, I pray for families right now that are hurting, that are broken, that are confused and mixed up. And Lord, I just pray for your truth and for your healing. I pray that you would take us back to the original design that you had for our families and for our relationships, that we would live in right relationship with you and that we would live in right relationship with each other. And Jesus, we thank you that you came and you walked this earth, you took on flesh, and you died on the cross for our sins so that we could have righteousness, right relationship with you and others. And today as we come before you and we meet with you in a special way at the communion table, for all of those who call themselves followers of Jesus, we thank you that we can meet with you and that we can take the bread and we can remember that you took on flesh and you walked this earth and you were crucified on a cross. We thank you that we can remember your blood that sanctifies us and cleanses us and washes us clean. And through that sacrifice that we can have relationship with you and that we can be made whole. And so Jesus, we come to you today. None of us are perfect. None of us are good enough. It's not about having a good enough week. It's recognizing our need for you. And that's what we do today. And so we come humbly and with, gratitude, with grateful hearts, saying again, we love you. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. And everyone agreed and said, amen. Well, let's take some time this morning.